And now chapter 89, Krishna and Arjun retrieve a Brahmin's sons. Shukdev Goswami said, Once, O king, as a group of sages were performing a Vedic sacrifice on the banks of the Sarasvati River, a controversy arose among them as to which of the three chief deities is supreme. Eager to resolve this question, O king, the sages sent Lord Brahma's son, Bhrigu, to find the answer. First he went to his father's court. To test how well Lord Brahma was situated in the mode of goodness, Bhrigu failed to bow down to him or glorify him with prayers. The Lord became angry at him, inflamed into fury by his own passion. Though anger toward his son was now rising within his heart, Lord Brahma was able to subdue it by applying his intelligence, in the same way that fire is extinguished by its own product, water. Bhrigu then went to Mount Kailas. There Lord Shiva stood up and happily came forward to embrace his brother. But Bhrigu refused his embrace, telling him, You are a deviant heretic. At this Lord Shiva became angry, and his eyes burned ferociously. He raised his trident and was about to kill Bhrigu when goddess Devi fell at his feet and spoke some words to pacify him. Bhrigu then left that place and went to Vaikuntha, where Lord Janardhan resides. There he went up to the Supreme Lord, who was lying with his head on the lap of his consort, Shri, and kicked him on the chest. The Lord then rose, along with Goddess Lakshmi, as a sign of respect. Coming down from his bedstead, that supreme goal of all pure devotees bowed his head to the floor before the sage and told him, Welcome, Brahman. Please sit in this chair and rest a while. Kindly forgive us, dear Master, for not noticing your arrival. Please purify me, my realm, and the realms of the universal rulers devoted to me by giving us the water that has washed your feet. This holy water is indeed what makes all places of pilgrimage sacred. Today, my Lord, I have become the exclusive shelter of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi. She will consent to reside on my chest because your foot has rid it of sins. Bhrigu felt satisfied and delighted to hear the solemn words spoken by Lord Vaikuntha. Overwhelmed with devotional ecstasy, he remained silent, his eyes brimming with tears. O King, Bhrigu then returned to the sacrificial arena of the wise Vedic authorities and described his entire experience to them. Amazed upon hearing Bhrigu's account, the sages were freed from all doubts and became convinced that Vishnu is the greatest Lord. From Him come peace, fearlessness, the essential principles of religion, detachment with knowledge, the eightfold powers of mystic yoga, and His glorification which cleanses the mind of all impurities. He is known as the supreme destination for those who are peaceful and equipoised the selfless, wise saints who have given up all violence. His most dear form is that of pure goodness, and the Brahmins are his worshipable deities, persons of keen intellect who have attained spiritual peace, worship him without selfish motives. The Lord expands into three kinds of manifest beings, 
the Rakshasas, the demons, and the demigods, all of whom are created by the Lord's material energy and conditioned by her modes. But among these three modes, it is the mode of goodness which is the means of attaining life's final success. The learned Brahmins living along the river Sarasvati came to this conclusion in order to dispel the doubts of all people. Thereafter, they rendered devotional service to the Supreme Lord's lotus feet and attained His abode. Sri Sutta Goswami said, Thus did this fragrant nectar flow from the lotus mouth of Shukdev Goswami, the son of the sage Vyasdev. This wonderful glorification of the Supreme Person destroys all fear of material existence. A traveler who constantly drinks this nectar through his ear holes will forget the fatigue brought on by wandering along the paths of worldly life. Once in Dwarka, a Brahmin's wife gave birth to a son, but the newborn infant died as soon as he touched the ground, O Bharat. The Brahmin took the corpse and placed it at the door of King Ugrasena's court. Then, agitated and lamenting miserably, he spoke the following, This duplicitous, greedy enemy of Brahmins, this unqualified ruler addicted to sense pleasure has caused my son's death by some discrepancies in the execution of his duties. Citizens serving such a wicked king who takes pleasure in violence and cannot control his senses are doomed to suffer poverty and constant misery. the wise Brahmin suffered the same tragedy with his second and third child. Each time he left the body of his dead son at the king's door and sang the same song of lamentation. When the ninth child died, Arjun, who was near Lord Keshava, happened to overhear the Brahmin lamenting. Thus Arjun addressed the Brahmin. What is the matter, my dear Brahmin? Isn't there some lowly member of the royal order here who can at least stand before your house with a bow in his hand? These Kshatriyas are behaving as if they were Brahmins idly engaged in fire sacrifices. The rulers of a kingdom in which Brahmins lament over lost wealth, wives and children are merely impostors playing the role of kings just to earn their livelihood. My lord, I will protect the progeny of you and your wife who are in such distress, and if I fail to keep this promise, I will enter fire to atone for my sin. Neither Sankarshan, Vasudev, Pradyumna, the best of bowmen, nor the unequaled warrior Aniruddha could save my sons. Then why do you naively attempt a feat that the almighty lords of the universe could not perform? We cannot take you seriously. I am neither Lord Sankarshan, O Brahman, nor Lord Krishna, nor even Krishna's son. Rather, I am Arjun, wielder of the Gandiva bow. Do not minimize my ability, which was good enough to satisfy Lord Shiva, O Brahman. I will bring back your sons, dear master, even if I have to defeat death himself in battle. Thus convinced by Arjun, O tormentor of enemies, the Brahmin went home, satisfied by having heard Arjun's declaration of his prowess. When the wife of the elevated Brahmin was again about to give birth, he went to Arjun in great anxiety and begged him, Please protect my child from death. After touching pure water, offering obeisances to Lord Maheshvara, and recollecting the mantras for his celestial weapons, Arjun strung his bow Gandiva. Arjun fenced in the house where the birth was taking place by shooting arrows attached to various missiles. 
Thus, the son of Prita constructed a protective cage of arrows covering the house upwards, downwards, and sideways. The Brahmin's wife then gave birth, but after the newborn infant had been crying for a short time, he suddenly vanished into the sky in his self-same body. The Brahmin then derided Arjun in front of Lord Krishna. Just see how foolish I was to put my faith in the bragging of a eunuch, when neither Pradyumna, Aniruddha, Ram, nor Keshava can save a person, who else can possibly protect him? To hell with that liar Arjun, to hell with that braggart's bow. He is so foolish that he has deluded himself into thinking he can bring back a person whom destiny has taken away. While the wise Brahmin continued to heap insults upon him, Arjun employed a mystic incantation to go at once to Samyamani, the city of heaven where Lord Yamaraj resides. Not seeing the Brahmin's child there, Arjun went to the cities of Agni, Niritti, Soma, Vayu, and Varuna. With weapons at the ready, he searched through all the domains of the universe, from the bottom of the subterranean region to the roof of heaven. Finally, not having found the Brahmin's son anywhere, Arjun decided to enter the sacred fire, having failed to keep his promise. But just as he was about to do so, Lord Krishna stopped him and spoke the following words. He said, I will show you the Brahmin's sons, so please don't despise yourself like this. These same men who now criticize us will soon establish our spotless fame. Having thus advised Arjun, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, had Arjun join him on his divine chariot, and together they set off toward the west. The Lord's chariot passed over the seven islands of the middle universe, each with its ocean and its seven principal mountains. Then it crossed the Loka Loka boundary, and entered the vast region of total darkness. In that darkness, the chariot's horses, Shaibya, Sugriva, Megapushpa, and Balahaka, lost their way. Seeing them in this condition, O best of the Bharats, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Master of all Masters of Yoga, sent his Sudarshan disk before the chariot. That disk shone like thousands of suns. The Lord Sudarshan disk penetrated the darkness with its blazing effulgence. Racing forward with the speed of the mind, it cut through the fearsome, dense oblivion expanded from primeval matter, as an arrow shot from Lord Ram's bow cuts through his enemy's army. Following the Sudarshan disk, the chariot went beyond the darkness and reached the endless spiritual light of the all-pervasive Brahma Jyoti. As Arjun beheld this glaring effulgence, his eyes hurt, and so he shut them. From that region they entered a body of water resplendent with huge waves, being churned by a mighty wind. Within that ocean, Arjun saw an amazing palace, more radiant than anything he had ever seen before. Its beauty was enhanced by thousands of ornamental pillars, bedecked with brilliant gems. In that palace was the huge, awe-inspiring serpent Anantashesha. 
he shone brilliantly with the radiance emanating from the gems on his thousands of hoods and reflecting from twice as many fearsome eyes. He resembled white Mount Kailas, and his necks and tongues were dark blue. Arjun then saw the omnipresent and omnipotent Supreme Personality of Godhead, Mahavishnu, sitting at ease on the serpent bed. His bluish complexion was the color of a dense rain cloud. He wore a beautiful yellow garment. His face looked charming. His broad eyes were most attractive, and he had eight long, handsome arms. His profuse locks of hair were bathed on all sides in the brilliance reflected from the clusters of precious jewels decorating his crown and earrings. He wore the Kostaba gem, the mark of Srivatsa, and a garland of forest flowers. Serving that topmost of all lords were his personal attendants, headed by Sunanda and Nanda, his chakra and other weapons in their personified forms, his consort potencies Pushti, Shri, Kirti, and Aja, and all his various mystic powers. Lord Krishna offered homage to himself in this boundless form, and Arjun, astonished at the sight of Lord Mahavishnu, bowed down as well. Then, as the two of them stood before him with joined palms, the almighty Mahavishnu, supreme master of all rulers of the universe, smiled and spoke to them in a voice full of solemn authority. I brought the Brahmin's sons here because I wanted to see the two of you, my expansions, who have descended to the earth to save the principles of religion. As soon as you finish killing the demons who burden the earth, quickly come back here to me. Although all your desires are completely fulfilled, O best of exalted personalities, for the benefit of the people in general, you should continue to exemplify religious behavior as the sages Nada and Narayan. Thus instructed by the Supreme Lord of the topmost planet, Krishna and Arjun assented by chanting Om, and then they bowed down to Almighty Lord Mahavishnu. Taking the Brahmin's sons with them, they returned with great delight to Dwarka by the same path along which they had come. There they presented the Brahmin with his sons, who were in the same infant bodies in which they had been lost. Having seen the domain of Lord Vishnu, Arjun was totally amazed. He concluded that whatever extraordinary power a person exhibits can only be a manifestation of Sri Krishna's mercy. Lord Krishna exhibited many other similar heroic pastimes in this world. He apparently enjoyed the pleasures of ordinary human life and he performed greatly potent fire sacrifices. The Lord having demonstrated his supremacy at suitable times he showered down all desirable things upon the Brahmins and his other subjects, just as Indra pours down his rain. Now that he had killed many wicked kings and engaged devotees such as Arjun in killing others, the Lord could easily assure the execution of religious principles through the agency of such pious rulers as Yudhishthir. Thus ends the 89th chapter of the 10th canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam entitled Krishna and Arjun Retrieve a Brahmin's Sons.